All right. Welcome, everyone. Thank you for being here. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, as you may know, the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana has recently taken over sister cities programs and develops new paths of engagement and learning with all nine of our sister cities. This Lunch and Learn series grew out of a desire to connect on a deeper level with our sister cities on issues of global importance. We will facilitate expert analysis and discussion on timely issues that impact us locally, nationally, and globally, especially during this pandemic. We're so glad you're here today for our discussion on women in leadership between Louisville, Kentucky and Perm, Russia. Let me quickly interrupt myself here and say, uh, if you are joining, uh, this is, we are simulcasting uh, in Russian and English. Uh, you'll need to go down to the bottom of your screen. Uh, there should be a globe that says interpretation. You're gonna select that and select which language you would like to hear from our interpreter, Lucy. So you're gonna either select English or Russian. Once you've done that selection, you will be placed into only one of those two rooms. And then you can hit mute original audio, which will make it so that you only hear the one language you have selected. So again, for those that have just joined us, welcome. Uh, for our interpretation feature, you'll need to scroll down to the bottom of your Zoom screen, hit the globe that says interpretation, select either English or Russian, and then you can mute the original audio, which will only allow you to hear your chosen language. All right, perfect. Um, my name is Samantha Risen. I am the Global Education's Program Coordinator for the World Affairs Council of Kentucky and Southern Indiana. WAC is a hub for international exchange, dialogue, and learning located in Louisville, Kentucky. We facilitate a variety of international professional and youth exchanges, speaker programs, and educational opportunities for the Kentuckiana region year round. Before we begin, just a quick rundown of our program. This webinar is being recorded and shared on Facebook. We'll provide a link to it after the program. Again, we have an interpreter for our Russian panelist. If you're an English speaker, please select the interpretation button, which looks like a globe, select English. If you're a Russian speaker, select Russian. Our moderator and panelist will hold a 60 minute discussion, after which we'll go into audience Q&A. Keep in mind, you can submit questions at any time during the program in the Q&A box. We'll collect them and answer as many as possible. Uh, I'm also trying to go slow so that we have a chance for our interpreter to catch up. She is doing an amazing job. We are excited to welcome Tina Ward-Pugh, Representative Nima Kolkarni, Jean West, and Jessica Young, all from Louisville, Kentucky, and Anna Karnakova, Dasha Safina, and Anna Barnoskevna from Perm. Tina is the director for the Office of Women for Louisville Metro and will be our moderator today. Tina represented District 9 on the Louisville Metro Council from 2003 until choosing not to seek re-election in 2014. She also served on the City of Louisville Board of Aldermen. We're so grateful to have her as a moderator. I'm now gonna turn it over to Tina who will introduce um, our amazing women leaders. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Samantha. Uh, what an honor to be here uh, and uh, be a part of this outstanding panel. Um, so here are uh, our leaders. Uh, Representative Nemo Kulkarni, member of the Kentucky House of Representatives, representing District 40. In 2018, Nemo became the first Indian immigrant to be elected in the history of the Kentucky legislature. She has also managed her own immigration law practice since 2010. And Jean West, welcome, owner and producer uh, at Faces West Productions and West Media Consulting. With more than 30 years experience as an Emmy Award-winning journalist at Way TV, 
WHAS TV and WSCL FM in Louisville, Kentucky. Jean has also uh, international broadcast experience as a reporter and anchor for the Far East Network in Japan. Her reports have appeared on National Public Radio and ABC's Primetime Live. Jessica Young, president at Simtech Inc., co-founder, New Vibes Wine Company. Jessica is the CEO and owner of three manufacturing companies. Simtech Inc., Axis and Action, Jessica has served as president of the National Association of Women Business Owners. Recently, Jessica, along with her four partners, launched New Vibes Wine Company. Anna Karatanova, chair of the committee, Perm Regional Branch of Opora Rossi. Anna started her own business in the field of energy and construction, including provision of technical assessment of buildings and construction, energy consulting, and surveying. Dasha Safina, reporter and deputy editor of Business Class, a Russian regional business publication. Dasha's professional interests lie in the area of urban planning and urban design, development of urban environment, and the dynamics of the quality of life in the area. And Anna uh, Baranovskaya, chairman of the Novobrodovsky territorial community self-governing body. As a self-described public activist, Anna coordinates economic activities aimed at fulfilling the social and communal needs of her local community. Anna has made it her mission to improve the public space of her neighborhood. So welcome you all. Thanks for joining us. Um, so women in leadership, let's jump right in and get this discussion going. As I ask a question, each of you, please feel free to respond as you would or not. Um, but there are a few questions that I'm going to ask that I'd love for each of you to respond to. So let's start off. What's one key leadership lesson you've learned in your career? We'll start. Jean, or there you go. <laughs> I'll start. Um, I've learned, well, uh, oh, thank you. Hello, Tina, and <laughs> welcome everyone. I'm delighted to be here. In the United States, it's St. Patrick's Day when yes. we wear green and we are all Irish for one day, even paint the river in Chicago green. So welcome. I have had many careers uh, and I have uh, learned few basic things. God has given women uh, a, a number of gifts, including insight and intuition. And when followed, they, those two qualities supersede kind of all of the other noise. So in leadership, I've learned it's called follow your gut. <laughs> if it doesn't feel right, it, it probably isn't because God has given us those gifts, number one. And number two, as a leader, not particularly as a woman leader, I have learned that sometimes those who push back against leadership doesn't mean that they are not team players. 
it could mean that they just see things a different way and maybe even have a better way. So instead of um, pushing back to push back, sit back and listen again, uh, one of the qualities I've learned and, and put yourself in those shoes and see their point of view. And uh, I think the, the leaders who do that get a much better result from uh, their teams and it makes for a happier environment. Yes, well said. Who's next? Perhaps someone from Perm. Okay, Jessica. Yes, I think one of the biggest key leadership uh, lessons that I've learned is playing to someone's strengths does not mean it is a threat to your authority. And in working within people's limitations and not limitations in a negative way, but that the team will be all the better for it when, when playing to strengths and, and looking at where each person can add value. Thank you. Yes. Someone from Parm. Yes. Anna. Всем здравствуйте. Наверное, в моей профессии самое главное – это суметь создать команду, сплотить людей, поскольку председательствование – это у нас больше в России, это волонтерский труд, то есть мы должны идти к единой цели, а одной это сделать невозможно, то есть только при создании команды идейников можно прийти а, к определенной цели или несколько целей. То есть это самое главное. И уметь, естественно, делегировать а, какие-то вопросы, какие-то значения своим коллегам. То есть самое главное – это а, создать команду. Спасибо. Yes. So, um... If anybody else wants to jump in, you're welcome to, or I can go to the next question. I can jump in. I, I wanted to make sure we had our, our visiting women um, give them an opportunity to speak. I'll be real brief. Um, I'm an elected official. And one thing I have found in my, you know, three years, it's not a whole lot of time, but I found it as an attorney as well, is that you have to find and keep your authenticity. Um, it is something that people know about you, they notice about you, and it allows you to do the things that Jean um, and Anna mentioned in terms of building teams, in terms of leading teams, uh, because people who know who you are um, and understand where you're coming from, they will be more likely to listen to you and to make sure that they are trying to understand your viewpoint because they know that you're trying to understand theirs. So it's, it's not as easy as it sounds. I will say that it is difficult. It takes a lot of self-knowledge um, and it takes a lot of confidence to keep it that way. You know, you have to not, not fall, fall prey to like imposter syndrome or self-doubt. Um, you need to understand who you are and be able to maintain that, I think, um, in order to be an effective leader. Yes, very insightful. Okay, so I'll head to the next question. Um, is there a particular leader you look up to, male or female, anyone? I, yeah, uh, I, I, many, I, I've had many of both, uh, both genders in various phases of my life. But I think the mentor, the most recent mentor whom I've had, it's really helped guide me through transitioning from being a day-to-day -day journalist to a business person and a business owner and then the consultant was actually Ruth Brinkley. I, I don't know, um, Ruth Brinkley was the head of 
a CHI in Jewish hospital, and she's been, um, you know, president and CEO of a number of healthcare companies who worked very closely with her, but she also mentored. And one bit of adv advice she told me was to find a mentor, someone that has your same values, same sense of worth, and, and get everything you can from them, talk to them. So we would talk uh, a lot of times. One of the things she mentioned to me was to not be afraid. Don't be afraid to ask for a raise. Don't be afraid to talk about money. Um, don't be um, afraid to stand your ground when again, you know in your gut something is right or wrong despite those who may push back, et cetera, stand your ground. So uh, yes, um, I, I go back to many of the conversations that we've had uh, because she's experienced those same things. It was important that she was also sort of the first African-American woman to break a lot of barriers mm -hmm. in an environment where there was just uh, a lot of um, opposition to her being there. So she learned how to gracefully cope and to succeed. Those are words of comfort. Um, others. I know that um, at different points in my in my own life, uh, I have had uh, leaders that I've looked up to. Jean, as you've suggested, when I was in graduate school, um, doing my placement, um, I got pulled in by the women leaders of the affordable housing movement here in Louisville, um, folks local folks like Sue Speed, Susie Post, Dolores Delahanty, um, you know, really just giants that have walked, you know, walked among us and, and that I knew. And then of course, um, you know, women uh, in, in sports and in politics as well. Um, but I think for me, what stood out, what you said were, were the values. It seems to be the constant theme or leaders we admire or respect or emulate uh, have to share that same value that we share, um, important. Are there others? If not, I'll head to the next question. Um, yes, Dasha, yes? Всем большое. Я очень рада быть здесь. Мне кажется, те вопросы, которые поднимаются в рамках этой встречи, они очень важны и актуальны. И для меня большая честь быть здесь и отвечая на заданный вопрос. Я не могу сказать, что у меня есть какой-то конкретный лидер или человек, на которого я равняюсь и на кого бы я хотела быть похожа на сто процентов. Но есть большое количество людей, качество которых и ценности которых мне близки. И в этом плане мне бы хотелось взять от них все самое лучшее, что есть, и внести в свою жизнь. И по этой причине, наверное, мне очень нравится читать биографии или истории о сильных женщинах, которые добились всего сами, преодолевая различные препятствия. Сейчас я читаю биографию Мэй Маск. Это не только мама Илона Маска, это потрясающая женщина с невероятной судьбой, которая очень успешной и состоялась. И такие истории меня действительно вдохновляют. Спасибо. I think, and I'll just jump in, it's, sure. it's difficult, Tina, when you're asking us to name one role model, mm -hmm. um, but I think because we'll, we'll all have so many throughout our lives, and I think that's, that's part of it, you know, um, you might have a different role model for a different situation or a different experience um, or, or a different scenario in your life that you need to, to look to some guidance for. 
Um, I, I like that Dasha mentioned some of her personal, like what, you know, in Jean as well, who do you carry with you in any situation? And I've got, I'm going to go ahead and combine two. I've got uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who I just sort of always keep in the back of my head. Um, and my grandmother, um, who, who died a few years ago in India. So I spent a lot of my childhood with her, didn't get to spend a whole lot of my adult life with her, but, but sort of she informed a lot of my, uh, my thinking. And, uh, and the two qualities they shared were a, a, sen you know, a sense of grace so, and calmness. And, and these are two qualities that you just immediately kind of washed over you when you were in the room with them. Um, it is not something that I've been blessed with naturally, but it's something I try to strive towards. Um, and, and I think that's, that's something that we need to, um, you know, focus on. It might not be something that you learn from them and have mastered, but something that you keep trying to accomplish that you admire in them. Yeah. You know, I have to add to your moments pretty cool as well love her to death. yeah it's true it's true <laughs> awfully 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 cool so. that's right sarika is is yes uh, she's the finest. she is inspiring so many women in her own way and i know don't mention that i didn't name her she'll be fine <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> i promise my lips are sealed <laughs> i'm not making a promise <laughs> Um, so um, our next question, if, if you, if each of you would take a, take a chance and answer this one. Um, so obstacles and barriers exist for every woman in the workplace, uh, but are especially evident for women of color. What advice do you have for women of color in hostile work environments? breathe mm. uh, number one count to ten <laughs> smile um keep a record mm. take notes with dates times uh witnesses mm. uh comments said verbatim keep a journal um and uh, the definition of uh, elegance is grace under pressure. Just be elegant. And it is so much easier said than done. And I have failed at it many times, but just aspire to that because trust me, better times are coming. You will, you will prevail if you follow that mode, okay, to protect yourself. Also know, and, and I've learned this too, HR is not always your friend. <laughs> yeah. HR is not always your friend. HR is always going to protect the company, always. So uh, that is why it's important, it's critical to keep a record, a detailed record of everything that you think has been egregious. Otherwise, the other advice is to uh, develop partnerships, uh, make friends outside of the office, uh, socialize uh, with friends and, and coworkers, and and build a, a trust uh, uh, with them. That's important. Would you agree, Nima? I would. I would. Those are very, as an attorney, very important things. I, I always keep notes. Always keep a record. Uh, because, you know, when you're, when you're in a hostile environment, that means that you're not able to, you know, as Jean mentioned, develop those partnerships within that situation, within that office, within that, you know, um, group that you're talking about. So it is, it is very important. And, and there's always this underlying factor, at least in the U.S., where we're not believing women, and we're especially not believing women of color. Um, and it's, it's, it's doubly important. Um, to make sure that there is a very clear record so that you cannot be refuted in your experience. Um, because simply stating this is what happened to me is not enough for women of color. And that, that's, that's black women, that's brown women, um, <clears throat> you know, that's immigrant women, that's, that's everybody. Um, it is just not the same reaction that you get. 
Um, and I'll add to, to Jean's excellent advice um, and say that, you know, you need to work towards actually recognizing hostility um, because not all hostility comes in the same shape and form. It's not always gonna be overt and illegal and against policy and against the law. There are many, many microaggressions, many, many micro hostilities that happen every single day that as women of color, you might just be used to rolling off because you know you have to have grace under pressure. You have to be the one who is um, calm, who is the one being the bigger person, who is not giving into uh, you know, any pettiness or hostility that you're encountering um, and, and treating every moment as a learning opportunity, as a teaching opportunity. So you're the one with the onus, uh, but you have to recognize constant pattern of hostility. And you, again, have to maintain a record Make sure that you're keeping detailed um, notes or, you know, a detailed record on some level so that you, at least for yourself, and then if it, if it does escalate, you know that there's a pattern that's been established and you're aware of it. Um, and, and that is important because we don't always recognize hostilities that aren't huge um, and in your face but they happen every day um, on smaller levels. We have to recognize uh, that pattern and learn to recognize those patterns. Yes, who else? Tina, can you yes. check with the uh, interpreter and ask if we were okay, if, we're, if we sure. need to lay down or anything? <laughs> sure, how are we doing? <laughs> Oh, okay. Excellent, excellent. Appreciate that confirmation. Does anyone else want to respond to that question? If not, um, so do women in your profession have a hard time? Getting... I think, yes. Tina, I think Anna wanted to say something. She okay, like Anna, yes, yeah, please do. здравствуйте. Я как-то все не решаю вступить в дискуссию. Всех приветствую, участниц. Вот раз уж мы тут про женщины и про сообщество женские, у меня достаточно огромный опыт сложился, несмотря на мой не очень большой возраст. Мне 42 года. Я мама четверых детей, достаточно успешный предприниматель и в рамках своего региона успешный лидер. И вот уже про опору России здесь упоминали. Вот как раз-таки в городе Перми, в Пермском крае, это сообщество создавало ну, я и женщин-предпринимателей, объединяло и проводилось очень много у нас работ, как с малым средним бизнесом, так и с более крупными представительницами для привлечения менторов. И хочу отметить, что... Все-таки была вот в Америке с предпринимательницами американскими в штате Кентукки, в Луивиле общались мы очень достаточно так в дружеской, в дружеской форме и много что нам рассказывали, что у нас в России все-таки вот этого гендерного деления намного меньше, нежели чем в Америке или в других странах. Это точно могу с уверенностью сказать, потому что даже мужское сообщество у нас отмечает то, что, например, бизнес – это не гендерный признак, это все-таки свойство, качества человека, это определенные, определенный характер, да, устойчивость, определенные цели. И вот как раз-таки многие даже в сфере власти представители у нас отмечают, что нет женского предпринимательства, нет мужского, есть просто бизнес. Но мы все равно настаиваем на том, что женское предпринимательство есть, потому что женщины занимаются все-таки более социальной направленностью. В частности, у нас, например, в Перми очень много женщин занимается воспитанием детей, то есть это какое-то дошкольное образование, да, дополнительные какие-то занятия с детьми. Это зона ответственности 
кафе, ресторанов, детского питания, это вопросы здравоохранения. То есть вот это более такие социальные сферы, которые близки женщинам, ну, потому что они мамы, да, потому что нужно воспитывать детишек и, так скажем, готовить их к взрослой жизни, растить здоровыми, умными, давать им образование. И вот это можно отметить. Хотя и много женщин-лидеров сейчас у нас есть и в политике, и в рамках крупного бизнеса много женщин встает на ключевые позиции как топ-менеджмента, серьезных отраслей энергетики, там, строительства. В частности, например, я свой бизнес построила в строительной отрасли, долго тоже работала в энергетике, и моя компания занималась проектированием и строительством как гражданских объектов, так и промышленных. Поэтому вот смотрю на женский бизнес все-таки как на более социальный, и в рамках вот этого мы реализуем более вот социальные проекты с женщинами-предпринимателями. Вот, а по вопросу, что делать на рабочем месте цветным женщинам, наверное, тоже у нас не так остро встает этот вопрос. У нас многонациональные, конечно, жители города Пермь. В общем, по крайней мере, у меня не было таких примеров, чтобы была какая-то дезориентация или преследование в коллективах женщин, которые другой национальности. Поэтому не, не могу поделиться вот этим опытом. Спасибо. Uh, to get to the place where you could start your own business or did you just uh, have the drive and the opportunity uh, and the courage? Um, В общем, я получила хорошее образование и получила хороший опыт работы на работодателя. Да, действительно, возможность открыть свой бизнес появилась тогда, когда я смогла сказать, что я эксперт отрасли, что я знаю определенную зону ответственности, которую я могу на себя взять. Для того, чтобы эту экспертность заработать, да, мне пришлось работать на работодателя и учиться. У меня три высших образования, то есть я три раза заканчивала университет в разных направлениях. Это первое образование экономика, второе образование управленческое. Было тоже необходимо для того, чтобы подняться до топ-менеджера в энергетической отрасли. И в дальнейшем, когда я стала предпринимателем в строительной отрасли, ну, мне вот пришлось еще раз закончить университет и получить строительное образование и стать экспертом именно в строительной отрасли. Когда экспертность стала достаточно высока, тогда собрала команду, да, получила стартап и достаточно быстро получилось стать лидером отрасли в своем регионе. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if I might um, do a little side conversation, Jessica, I'm curious, um, because you've been successful and now have three men, I believe three companies manufacturing and, um, how do you react to that? Perhaps, um, 
we we are farther behind than uh, our counterparts around the world. And um, and and what what was your um, what was your track? Did you have to go through that promotion uh, working in your industry for a number of years um, to 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 be successful to get where you are? Well, my story and my path is a little peculiar. So I actually started out in commercial banking, which is also a male dominated industry. <clears throat> I spent 10 years in it. And yes, um, I encountered firsthand um, the disparity in the workplace. Um, my male counterparts were making 40% more than me, were less educated, and, uh, and I was outperforming them. Um, so I started to raise my hand and kind of make a ruckus there. But then moving into manufacturing, uh, which is obviously a, a very male dominated industry. Uh, my partner and I purchased Simtex. So it's a little bit different of a scenario. Um, but to that end, I had to work doubly as hard to prove myself, not only to our teammates, but also to my customers, to my vendors and suppliers. And I still encounter that to this day uh, where you, know, you walk into a room, you know, and there, who's this young girl, you know, trying to conduct business here. Um, so to be taken seriously in, in that regard, I think that's going to continue to be an obstacle. Um, and, and I try very diligently not to raise awareness that that there is a gender <laughs> difference, you know, business is business. And that's, that's very black and white. Um, but yes, to answer your question, it, it's been a very difficult path um, that I don't see, um, you know, completely getting better in, in the near future. But I'm a huge advocate for getting more women in the boardrooms, more women in the workplace. And, and then internally within our three manufacturing firms, we've placed a huge focus on bringing the next generation up. We just recently launched a women in manufacturing group for our regional area. And that's for women at every level of manufacturing to show them that there are fantastic careers, fantastic fantastic pathways uh, for them to build a career. And then moreover, to break the misconception that one, it's for men, um, two, that it's dark, dingy, and not a great career path. Excellent. Excellent. That's um, sh sharing that, you know, uh, today or for you know, this to be broadcast around the world, I think is important uh, locally and globally uh, as we account for our own system. So I, I, so this next question, um, it, it, I'm, I'm gonna try to say it um, or word it. Have you ever been called or referred to uh, by something that was offensive to you or that you felt was disrespectful for example, have you been called hun? You know that hun. Hun, can you go get that for me? Or have you been called um, sweetheart? Uh, have you, when you're negotiating, have men referred to you or even other women as, as that's aggressive for a woman? I mean, you're being kind of aggressive here when in fact it's it's the the standard operating uh, you know how men operate and others do in in natural negotiations what's been your experience with with language and naming uh, and, and give us some examples if you would Jean I see you wanting to start right <laughs> You know, a lot of it is regional. Uh, you know, uh, I grew up in the South and Hun is yeah. not offensive. Uh, you know, it's just, uh, you know, it, it, it just, you're in the store or uh, uh, you meet a client and you say, thank you, Hun. I mean, you know, that just is. Yeah. However, there is a line uh, when you're superior or you're a boss and yes, I've had those uh, comments made and, uh, I, I just always say, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And they either repeat it, which isn't good, or, or they choose another word. But yes, that mm -hmm. that's those are one of the things. And you know, of course, in my case, you know, it, it gets even worse. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, and again, who's the journalist again? Who's the journalist? Is it Dasha? 
from Perm. Uh, let's see. Which one is the journalist? Maybe. Okay. And I'm wondering if she get um, comments uh, from uh, readers or viewers or whatever, because you know, I would say to my friends, if you ever think you're having a bad day, come <laughs> to the newsroom and answer the phones uh, because, mm -hmm. um, you know, you develop a really thick skin or you go home crying every night. So it's, uh, yeah, it's just, it's, it, it, it's just something you just deal with. Who's the, who's the journalist, which one? Возможно, мне очень повезло оказаться работать в компании в абсолютно здоровой обстановке. У нас есть директор, это женщина, она отвечает за финансовые вопросы, и есть главный редактор, это мужчина, и он отвечает за творческую часть. При этом... Внутри компании я не сталкивалась никогда с ущемлением по каким-либо признакам, по любым. Но что касается профессиональной, профессионального аспекта, такое было, но скорее это связано не с гендерными предрассудками, а, наверное, с дискриминацией по возрасту, с эйджизмом. Я начинала работать, когда мне было 22, и выглядела я, наверное, на 15. И требовалось время, чтобы доказать, что ты действительно не глупый человек, что ты разбираешься в теме, и что ты вообще адекватный человек. С этой точки зрения, мне кажется, мужчинам работать и начинать карьеру гораздо проще, чем женщинам. Вот. Спасибо. Я хочу отметить, что в моей команде никаких фамильярностей со стороны ни мужчин, ни женщин нет, но поскольку я на своем уровне человек публичный, у нас очень активно созданы соцсети, чаты, вот там у нас больше тысячи человек, и там уже от жителей могут быть и даже в какой-то степени оскорбления, потому что это очень легко человеку написать, когда нет его фотографий, возможно, даже какие-то так называемые фейковые имена. То есть человеку на той стороне просто сказать, нежели в глаза. Когда встречаешься с людьми, где-то в компании никогда таких э, слов нет. Но именно в чатах, в соцсетях э, я с этим сталкивалась. Э, ну, стараюсь выходить из этой ситуации либо с юмором, либо ставить, э, рассказывать о, о своей деятельности. Э, в общем-то, э, в лицо никто ничего не говорит. То есть именно где-то только в соцсетях, я хочу заметить. Это, наверное, у нас в России это везде, не только в председательствовании. Это и у депутатов, и у руководителей районов, городов. То есть очень часто есть негативные отклики. И хочу еще сказать, друзья, знаете, что... Наверное, кто пишет э, негативные вещи, оскорбления, это все-таки люди несчастные. Счастливые люди никогда оскорблять а другого человека не будут. Вот это уже подмечено. Подмечено мной и не только. Спасибо. Yeah, I mean, I just have to say, um, I'm learning so much uh, that I had no idea about, and I am reminded yet again that in so many ways, uh, we are a young country here in America and, and haven't always chosen the best path to, to growing up. And getting to the place where perhaps 
there is equal opportunity. Um, it crossed my mind, Dasha, when you were speaking um, and you said that from time to time you had been confronted, but it was more about your professionalism or, or your, um, what, what you knew. Um, and it crossed my mind, would you ever think of and have you ever thought of uh, confronting a man uh, with that same requirement that he prove his value or that he was worth his job? Does, you know what I'm saying? Would you do that as a female to him or does it not cross your mind? Если можно, я прокомментирую да, вот этот вопрос. Yeah. Вот мне тоже очень повезло, и, и все коллективы, в которых я работала, они были достаточно мужские. Я работала много под началом именно мужчин, и первые мои руководители на производстве, я работала на машиностроительном заводе, тоже были все мужчины. Несмотря на это... Я свою карьеру тоже начинала достаточно молодой, 24 года. Как-то вот серьезно относились, и не могу сказать, что у меня были прецеденты, когда мужчины каким-то образом ущемляли какие-то профессиональные качества или как женщину. А вот на предмет того, чтобы мужчина доказал свою там, экспертность и компетентность, да, такие вопросы возникают достаточно часто, потому что мужчины любят, так скажем, задирать голову, и многие завышают свою самооценку, так скажем, да, и свои компетенции. У меня на, в моей компании тоже очень много работало мужчин технической направленности, технических специальностей, и даже в свое время приходилось проводить специальные аттестации, чтобы именно мужчин, так скажем, приземлять, да, и чтобы они доказывали свою компетентность. Да. Женщины в этом плане ведут себя намного скромнее, наоборот, где-то даже умалчивают свои сильные стороны, да, свой профессионализм. И, и с женщинами даже бывает, что приходится, наоборот, говорить, что нужно где-то проявлять себя и больше показывать свои навыки. Спасибо. Thank you. Um, I didn't know if Dasha was going to reply. That, that, that reminds me or sends me back to the comment um, um, about proving our worth. Do you find that um, you get equal pay, um, that, that the system for, um, for getting paid is fair? Um, have you had to advocate for yourself to be paid um, the same as or more than a male counterpart? Um, and how do you deal with that within your company? How do you assess or how do you, do, do you have a system to ensure um, equal pay for equal work is in place? Open it up here. Yes, вот sure. я могу да, прокомментировать вот за свой труд, так скажем, и как предпринимателя, как не предпринимателя, у нас такого разделения не существует. Есть штатное расписание, есть установленные, так скажем, тарифы, да, оплаты труда которые независимо от того, женщина или мужчина на этом месте работают, оплачиваются одинаково. Важно, чтобы 
специалист или руководитель подходили по своим компетенциям и критериям, то есть выставленный стаж работы или специализированное образование. То есть если человек обладает этими всеми компетенциями для работы на этом рабочем месте, то разделения по заработной плате не бывает. I think Dasha was trying to say something. Yes. Dasha. Yes. Да, я, наверное, только могу лишь подтвердить слова Анны. Yes. Абсолютно аналогичная ситуация. И наши задачи только от выполнения. И от выполнения поставленных задач, от выполнения KPI, и она не зависит от этого. I don't hear an interpreter in English. Looks like there you are. Yes, that's right. Wow. <laughs> wow is right. <laughs> wow. Oh boy. That's news. Um, you know, I, I have to I wonder, uh, Tina, is that, uh, is that a remnant of the uh, Soviet uh, regime where kind of every, everything and everybody was on an even keel? Interesting question. Interesting. I'd like to know the answer to that as well, because you've got countries like China as well, where women are considered equal in military and business and, you know, every industry. And I wonder if they also have set pay rates where they don't have to worry about, you know, do we need to see all our pay records and compare them and then sue people to get the same wage rate for the same work? I mean, that's, we seem very, very much more um regressive in this country with regard to that so i would be curious to hear an answer as well and the added component to that if someone would answer that for us those uh is is it also perhaps in our country uh left over from women being chattel um women being property um and, and us being a young country starting out on the wrong path too. So someone from Parham wanna? Um, offer a response. How long has it been this way that the salary ranges are set? Uh, how, how who, who, who set that? Um, was it women generations ago or people generations ago or? Were people fighting for equality in the last uh, 400 years? You know, uh, um, it's a big deal here in our country. <laughs> it's a big deal. It affects, it affects your health care, your retirement, your um, ability to uh, have a stable housing. I mean, it's it's just equal pay is just um, a big issue here. Anyone? She's still asking the question. Ah, да, действительно. В равноправии у нас в России сохранилось со времен СССР после революции, когда начали устанавливать коммунистическую партию, 
вот так скажем, объявили это равноправие между женщинами и мужчинами. И с тех времен было независимо от, от того, женщина это или мужчина, были одинаковые зарплаты и впоследствии даже очень много мужских профессий стали занимать женщины. В царстве России до революции, до того, как у нас был простроен коммунистический строй, это гендерное разделение точно прослеживалось. И больше хочу сказать, женщин даже не брали вообще в принципе на многие работы, и женщина не должна была работать. И да, вы правильно отметили, скорее всего, что именно во времена СССР это и произошло. I think it's so interesting. I agree with Jean. I think that is such an interesting thing that I've learned here. Um, because you know we're a capitalist yeah. and we hear a lot about you know socialism and communism and how terrible that is and capitalism is the best form and you know when you start talking about equal pay for equal work the free market just goes out the window and that are, no one talks about that anymore um and i think it's really really interesting how we just sort of demonize or or you know vilifies the entire economic system entire governmental system without recognizing the strides that it has made for women anyway. And I'm, I'm just, I'm going to do a lot more research on that <laughs> for sure. Yeah. So um, what advice, what advice would you all give to younger generations or women who are out there thinking about taking that leap of um, either starting their own business or working towards um, owning their own business uh, or being at a high level um, CEO uh, of, of many companies. What advice would you, would you give people? Would you give women who are considering this? Acquire and value your women friends. Have a tribe. I have a tribe of female friends that I can commiserate with, uh, celebrate with, get advice from. They tell me when I'm wrong. Um, it's critical to have women friends. Um, it's interesting, someone said to me, how do, how do you get someone to change their minds? We are humans, homo, homo sapiens are pack animals. We live and breathe and function in tribes, like families, sororities, fraternities, whatever. When you're trying to get someone to change their mind, they're afraid of leaving their tribe and that support. So what you do is you bring that person into your tribe and offer them support and show them how your tribe can embrace them. And you know, the easiest way to do that is over a meal, a drink, it's just talking to them. But it's critical to have women friends, or well, truly friends. Wise advice. And I'll just, I have a, I agree that you need to, so, you know, you need to get your own, own tribe, your own group of folks that especially the most important thing that will tell you when you're wrong, when you're doing the wrong thing, Um, it's a terrible idea, even if it's just don't wear that. Um, it's, it's important uh, to have somebody that's willing to tell you all of that. I, I will say that it's, it's interesting to me. Um, I have started my own business, so I have my own law practice, and I've run um, an, a campaign and, and run for elected office. And, and a lot of times, you know, I think a lot of that comes from my background. My parents moved us to, to Louisville when I was little, I mean, they had good jobs. They just up and left. I'm sure people told them they, this was a bad idea. Don't do this. What are you doing? Um, you've got two little kids. Um, what are you, what are you planning? You know, what are you planning to do? And I think that, you know, at some point you can't wait for somebody to encourage you to do any of these things. You have to take the leap 
yourself and make that decision yourself. And it's easy for me to say something like that just because I've seen my parents do it. And not everybody has that experience and that sort of, um, you know, ex like role model, you know, to look up to where they, I see my parents have done it and they've succeeded and they're helping other people do it. And it's, you know, but it's something that, you know, to Jean's point, if you don't have that in your personal life, go find people that, that have that experience and that are able to let you know what to expect, let you know how to start, what is the next step? Um, because ultimately my advice is just do it. I'm gonna go ahead and appropriate the Nike uh, slogan because you have to, we need more women in business. We need more women business owners. Um, we need more women in the legal profession. We need more women in journalism in elected office. I mean, you name it, we have got to have more women and that's the only way you're gonna see any change. And it sounds like um, in Perm, Russia, it's a little bit more egalitarian, but in, in the US, that's the only way we're gonna see change. Um, you know, we've got a lot of laws on the books that, that prohibit discrimination, that um, encourage equality, but you can't, you know, sort of legislate um, your way to right action. At some point, you're going to have to be, I'm using a lot of platitudes here and I apologize, but you're going to have to be the change um, that you want to see. And, and that's, that's my advice. You're just going to have to do it yourself. And I encourage you to, because it's going to be one of the most rewarding things that you'll ever do. Я тоже, если позволите, прокомментирую. Я сама ментор и бизнес-тренер, запускала много женщин-предпринимателей, помогала стартапам. И для себя я отметила точно на 100%, что очень важно попасть в сообщество. Важно, чтобы тебя поддержали и важно преодолеть вот этот страх и начать. А когда ты начал, не останавливаться а всегда, чтобы было где спросить, а что делать дальше, а что если не получается. И как раз таки вот эти сообщества, у нас этих женских объединений, вот предпринимателей женских, достаточно сейчас много организовывается, не только в рамках опоры России. И женщины, находя свое сообщество, где-то даже, может быть, конкретно той отрасли, в которой она хочет создать бизнес, она на самом деле получает вот эту поддержку, да, и не останавливается, так скажем, идет до конца и развивает свой бизнес. Женщин у нас упорных много, потому что я считаю, что так как-то складывается, особенно вот, не знаю, не отметили этот вопрос, в пандемии очень много разводов случилось. Женщинам нужно кормить своих детей. Женщины ищут возможности да, заработать, чтобы их дети получили хорошее образование, медицинское обслуживание и, ну, так скажем, качество жизни. Поэтому женщины у нас достаточно активны в этом плане. И как-то вот немножко пожурю мужчин, ответственность как-то они в последнее время плохо несут за своих детей. И все чаще встречается, что да, разводятся. И как раз-таки женщина вот у нас в России ущемлена в этом плане. Да, и у нас положены законом алименты, но очень много мужчин, которые даже от этих обязательств отклоняются. Поэтому женщины в России более решительны, и если начинают свой бизнес, как правило, доводят его до результата. И очень интересные у нас есть проекты. Если когда-то придется нам еще пообщаться, мы могли бы поговорить об этом. Прямо с такими идеями хорошими бывают приходят женщины с новыми, не классическими какими-то вариантами, там, не юриспруденция экономика, а, например, там какие-то интересные инновационные даже технологии. Как в IT-технологиях очень много сейчас женщин у нас стало тоже продвигаться, хотя я считаю, что программирование это сугубо мужская какая-то отрасль, но вот даже несмотря на это очень много женщин сейчас у нас появляется стартаперов даже в этом направлении. 
Спасибо. Тина, uh, if you want to ask one more question, and then um, I will take over and do some audience Q and A's. Good, good. Um, yes, so I just wanted to uh, offer an opportunity for you to give a, um, to promote uh, any local organizations that uh, have been important to your success. Um, uh, growing up, uh, were you a Girl Scout? You know, you know, those kinds of things. And as you got older, um, for instance, the Rotary Club, Jean, you mentioned earlier, um, you know, the World Affairs Council, uh, our, the National Organization for Women, NAVO. Um, are there organizations here uh, locally in Louisville or national affiliates, regional affiliates? that you all could share now for those here locally that are listening that women might want to get engaged in or be a part of. And also in PARM, is, is there a, an organization that, that is available for women to join to, to, to gain some of those leadership and entrepreneurial skills? Um, Jean. Well, thank you. Since you um, mentioned Rotary uh, and Nima, I want you to come back. <laughs> I, I joined Rotary after I, I retired from day-to-day -day journalism because I had the time and, and because of their work in polio, with polio. Wow. And actually, I've gotten two additional jobs wow. just for Rotary it, uh, events. Not only that, is that it's an organization, it's a service organization, and I don't know that a lot of people don't really know what we do, but I encourage you and, and Nima and Tina, um, our Rotary has done a pivot after this past summer. And I'm happy to say that I am the incoming president of the Rotary Club of Louisville, the first African-American in its 108 year history. But this was done two years ago before all uh, the unrest, the summer, et cetera, the uh, Breonna Taylor incidents of social injustice and the pandemic, which completely transformed everything. So we've done a pivot and I am so glad of my club, which has become, our mission is to be inclusive and um, uh, responsive. And we, my term begins in July and we are, we're just really, um, gonna make a difference in this community. So I would encourage, especially women, young women, men, uh, join Rotary. Come and at least uh, visit a meeting as my guest. I'd love to have you, we're virtual right now, but uh, come and see what we're doing. And there, there are advantages to you and your business in being a part of Rotary. Excellent. How about yeah, you? I, 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 yeah. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, no, go ahead. Um, I want to echo that. And I, I was part of Rotary. I loved it. It's a service organization, as Jean mentioned, and I, I gravitate towards organizations that have that sort of mission and purpose um, to help others in, in some capacity. Um, I only left because of time commitments. It was just, it was impossible for me to be a good Rotarian um, at, at that point, but I still keep in touch and, and certainly will will take Jean's offer of, of a visit anyway, uh, even though she did, she was talking about newer, younger women, but that's okay. I'll go no, ahead. You are the younger women. <laughs> no, really, no, really. <laughs> but yeah. that's a great organization and they have really, they've really changed a lot of their policies to accommodate younger people, working people, um, you know, making sure that they are available as mentors as well, um, to Jean's point in terms of business. Um, and I, you know, I, that's a great organization. There are a lot of service organizations in Louisville. Um, you know, I will, I will talk about Volunteers of America, which has a great relationship, obviously, with Rotary. Rotary, by the way, has a great organization with all of the service organizations in, in Louisville. So it's a great place to start um, if you have no idea where to look. Um, and I have a special place in my heart, of course, for Volunteers of America. My mom started her nonprofit um, with Kentucky Refugee Ministries, partnered with VOA, and of course, her program to help uh, refugee and disadvantaged women is now a program um, that is VOA-wide. Uh, 
And so that is something that I'm very proud of for her on her behalf. Um, and I, I think, you know, the other thing we, we talked about kind of getting involved and, and taking the leap to start a business or running for office. Um, and, and I think one of the things that we need to make sure that we do as women is develop and cultivate these networks with these organizations, whether they're business oriented or service oriented or you know, issue specific. Um, I, I was a board member at the Community Foundation of Louisville and I had to roll off again because of time commitments, um, but it really uh, you know, made me aware and gave me a different perspective on, on philanthropy in Louisville and where does that money go and who are these donors? And, um, and they did a lot of work you know, trying to focus on, on uh, nonprofits and areas of Louisville that are disadvantaged, that don't get sort of this um, philanthropic help that other areas get uh, historically, traditionally. Um, and I think that, that we're seeing that with a lot of different service organizations in Louisville. There's a recognition that, you know, everything's kind of been focused on one way, on one group of people, and they want to move um, to helping as many people as possible, especially underrepresented folks um, and, and historically disadvantaged people. Um, I, I will give a plug for Emerge Kentucky, which is um, a, a, an organization that trains democratic women. Um, I don't know that there's one um, for, uh, you know, any nonpartisan in Louisville. I know they have them nationwide, but that is a very, very good organization for women who are wanting to run for office as Democrats. Um, because again, it's a network. It's a very solid network that you can rely on um, to ask questions, to get guidance. Um, and I think that that is, that is crucial no matter what you do in your life, whether you start a business, whether you want to become more involved uh, with an issue or, or a particular area. So I, I, I say, you know, look at joining as many as you can, depending on your time, um, because you will get a different benefit and a different experience from each service organization um, and, and community foundation and Rotary are two great ones to, to start out with, I think. Well, I'll, I'll take this opportunity to plug the National Association of Women Business Owners, which also looks to uh, propel women into a sphere of influence, both personally, professionally, or politically, whatever that may mean to them. And, and in my chat box, I did mention that here in the U.S., a female could not get a business loan without a male co-signer until 1988 which just blows my mind, especially coming from the commercial banking side and now owning three manufacturing companies. But NABO was the driving force behind that legislation. So making extremely impactful and powerful uh, movements to help propel women into those three spheres of influence. Uh, locally, the NABO Kentucky chapter also recognizes us regionally, which is that Southern Indiana corridor as well. Um, and so that has been just a fantastic um, opportunity to not only reach back and bring the next generation up through young entrepreneurial programs, but also to help propel women that are at that point of a career change or making that leap into business or scaling up their business. Most women business owners here um, don't own companies over a million dollars in revenue. So how do we propel women into that next level as well? So a uh, huge plug for NABO. Uh, you had mentioned, Tina, that I enjoy drinking, obviously starting a wine company and we're in the heart of bourbon country. Um, Women Who Wine for a Cause is also a fantastic networking organization that I sit on the board uh, for. And each year we uh, work with philanthropies, including the Beaded Treasures Project, um, to help propel women, connect, communicate, and celebrate. Because too often we're too busy grinding away and living that new norm or trying to find that perfect work-life blend that we don't take the time to celebrate the small successes. So I, I, I would certainly plug those two organizations from a networking and finding your tribe perspective. I'd love to hear more about that, Jessica. Absolutely. <laughs> well, how about in Perm? This is your chance. Plug an organization. <laughs> У нас тоже очень много общественных ресурсов, которые не только женщинам и мужчинам позволяют ну, обрести, так скажем, поддержку 
и обучение в рамках общественной деятельности. У нас очень много бесплатного бизнес-обучения есть на общественных площадках. Также у нас тоже работают НКО для незащищенных слоев населения, то есть есть общественные организации, которые оказывают помощь и поддержку женщинам, оказавшимся в трудной жизненной ситуации с различными телефонами поддержки и так далее. Очень много социальных акций по там, сбору каких-то вещей, да, помощи нуждающимся людям и женщинам, потому что ситуации всякие могут возникнуть в жизни. А в части предпринимательства, да, у нас есть основные три национальных, так скажем, федеральных общественных объединений, которые помогают полноценно, так скажем, стать предпринимателем. Это «Опора России», «Торгово-промышленная палата» и «Деловая Россия». Это вот три, так скажем, основных таких общественные организации в рамках федерации. Ну и понятно, что в Перми есть более маленькие какие-то вот организации, которые тоже помогают стать предпринимателем, женщинам помогают. В этом мы с вами похожи, я думаю, что вот все, что вы рассказываете, у нас примерно так же происходит. Спасибо. Just want to say it's been an honor to be with you all today uh, and best of luck to you all. Samantha. Thank you, Tina. Um, we have a couple of audience questions that we'll transition into now. Uh, so the first one from Susan is how can we best overcome the economic losses women have suffered because of the pandemic? I can, I'll just jump right in. It's been devastating. Um, the amount of women that have left the workforce is astonishing. And they're largely doing it because of childcare concerns. Um, and you know, there's, there's statistics about how like 42% of, of white women regain their employment once they've settled or stabilized their the situation, but only 30 something percent of black women do. Um, so even with this pandemic and the recovery that we're talking about within just women, there is such a huge disparity um, and a huge gap in, in getting people back on their feet, getting families back on their feet. Um, and I think we're not, we're doing nothing. I mean, we're not doing anything uh, to, to focus on that. I know that in, in this new federal stimulus plan, the American Rescue Plan, There are funds for direct assistance, um, you know, but that goes through the state and I'm hoping, hope through the states, uh, you know, generally, but I, I am, I'm hoping that there is some, uh, something specific, a specific program, or if we could, you know, as women, even just women in Louisville, try to figure out a way to divert um, or encourage some of that funding to go back to getting women back in the workplace or stabilizing them financially enough or for childcare purposes, whatever it may be, because they're not coming back um, in the numbers that they should be. And there's been such a loss in our workforce that we, we really need to look at this as a huge economic issue uh, right now and moving forward, sir. Thank you, Nima. Yeah, we read a report recently, we discussed it at the World Affairs Office because we are an office of four women that uh, the latest report that came out about job losses in America uh, virtually 99.9% .9 of the job losses uh, for the previous quarter had been women. Uh, so it, it affects us deeply. Um, from PERM, is, is there a different perspective since you seem more egalitarian? Если интересно про Россию, прокомментирую тоже. Да, действительно, у нас тоже сложная ситуация. Вот в рассвете пандемии вот, очень тоже много женщин, именно женщин, да, потеряли работу, потому что нужно смотреть за детьми. И очень много малого и среднего бизнеса именно в социальной сфере, в образовании, да, это, то есть система там, ресторанных и кафе услуг, 
это же все позакрывалось, и, соответственно, очень много женщин осталось без работ. Вот не могу прокомментировать, как решается это с помощью общественных организаций, но государство, конечно, тоже выделяет пособия по безработице увеличенные, да, там более лояльные условия предлагает с какими-то, может быть, кредитными ставками или рефинансирование кредитов, что тоже очень многим помогает. Даже кредитные каникулы на время пандемии у нас объявлены для многих женщин-предпринимателей. И для сохранения рабочих мест у нас тоже были сформированы для бизнеса серьезные поддержки в рамках компенсации выплаты заработной платы для сохранения рабочих мест. В общем, конечно, 99% не наблюдается прирост, но процентов 20 можно сказать, что да, женщин потеряли свои рабочие места. So some things truly are universal, sadly. Um, so it seems like it's an issue in both countries that we are going to have to figure out. Uh, as women, as always. Uh, our next question is from Sophie. It'll be the last question that I pose uh, for our panelists today, and then we will do a short wrap up. Uh, so Sophie has asked how to best support women leaders uh, in refugee slash internally, internally displaced women. Uh, when resettled, how do we identify those women and how do we lift them up? Tina, you can feel free to jump in as well. Is this for anybody? Sorry. Yeah, I was so sorry. Yeah, 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 this was just posed to anyone. <laughs> uh, well, I'll, I'll, I'll start. Um, you know, one of the things that I talk about a lot, I'm an immigration attorney and I, I focus my practice on employment-based immigration, right? So um, like whatever the legal system is that, that everyone understands. Um, I, my concern has always been that we do not talk about immigration as an economic issue and a workforce issue enough um, you know, by 2065, Pew Research has estimated that 88 percent, and it's probably higher, uh, of our entire population growth and therefore labor growth um, is go going to be due to immigrants and, and their children, so first generation folks. And that's a bottom line number. Um, and, and what we do not do, you know, in, in this, in the American system, you have uh, refugees that are able to come over here through after they've gone through a rigorous vetting process. Um, for, for criminal background checks, you know, for medical background checks. Um, and they come here and they get six months of assistance, um, which means what, right? They get resettled, um, they get housing, they get food assistance, um, they get some English language lessons. And in six months, that, that cuts off. So you're expected to, having fled, you know, a traumatic, um, devastating situation in your home country. Not You're not choosing to leave your home. You have to run away. You have to flee something terrible that's happening. Um, come here, you get six months of help, and then you're on your own. And, you know, Louisville uh, does a lot. It tries, but there's no funding, right, for any additional help. And so you may have nonprofit organizations that try to help wherever they can, um, but fundamentally, one thing that you'll find is that immigrants are hard workers, you know, whether they've come over as refugees, whether they've chosen to come here, um, they don't want to get help uh, all the time. And one of the things that we can do is identify the people um, that want to work, but also what their qualifications are. So this question of credentialing becomes an important priority um, for, for every city and every state that, that is resettling refugees or internally displaced people. I mean, this is true around the world. I'm just speaking for the American system. Um, we don't do that very well. And so you've got physicians, for instance, that are trained doctors in their home countries that come here, cannot fulfill the medical licensure exam or do not know what the steps are because all of this is expensive. All of this takes time. It takes a good, obviously excellent working knowledge of English 
Um, and, and nobody's helping them with that. Um, and so there's no way for them to navigate this very simple thing that people don't always think about is I have this qualification back home. I am not able to do anything like that here. I am underemployed to a severe degree. I'm not contributing to the economy. I'm not contributing to my community um, on the level that I was educated and have experience in. And that's, that's one, one thing that we can do. Um, is to help identify individuals by their qualifications and plug them in um, to the ecosystem here, whether it's entrepreneurs, whether it's physicians, whether it's nursing, whether it's educators, whether it's artists, um, they need to, we need to do that. We need to provide that as a service as vital as food and as shelter. Um, and we have to be able to do that well past the six month phase, um, because this is something that, that we are not recognizing, we're not talking about, um, and it's something that's pretty easy that we can do in, in smaller communities. So Louisville for sure needs to, needs to identify these individuals and connect them um, with whoever and whatever organization they, they need to be connected with. Thank you, Nima. Uh, thank you all to those who submitted questions. I hate to cut us off at this point, uh, but we are sadly running out of time. Uh, thank you all ladies for your thoughts on women in leadership today. Uh, very, as someone said in the comments, very inspired and uplifting conversation. Um, the World Affairs Council is especially grateful to the Metro Office for Women and the Office for Globalization for their support. Uh, interpretation services were provided by Open World Leadership Center. Uh, thank you to Lucy for uh, all of her help today. A quick reminder that WAC provides virtual programming nearly every week. Our signature speaker series is also virtual and features national experts, authors, and diplomats discussing current global issues. Our March speaker series will be held on the 25th of this month and features Thomas Balalki on plagues and the paradox of progress. Uh, more information can be found on our website, which is worldkentucky.org. I hope you'll consider joining us and consider supporting WAC by becoming a member. Thank you all for joining. We'll see you next time. Thank you. Goodbye.